Hey everyone, hope they're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna rip through Twitter, see what people are sharing on social media. Uh, I'm gonna interject my financial opinions as we go, generally related to three different topics, wealth building, commodities, and or financial topics. So we're gonna dive right in there. We're gonna take a look and see what people are sharing on Twitter. If you wanna follow me, it's at finding underscore finance. And if you wanna join our community, finding-value.com is where I dive deeper into these topics looking for potential investment opportunities across the entire spectrum of the markets, irrespective of sector, I look at it and make an opinion. But most of the, the undervalued sectors are in commodities at this time in precious metals. So looking at bullish trend, he says, the Biden administration buys nearly 5 million barrels of oil as it refills the reserves. Uh, and that generally, you know, I, I think that the team over there, government and Powell and all those guys, I think they're probably trying to get us into a slowdown. And these guys would be refilling the SPR when they get a slowdown. Uh, I think the slowdown is here, most likely, and that's why they're buying oil at these lower prices. Uh, so yeah, they're refilling the reserves here, or at least trying to. And 5 million barrels are going to have to continue to, to buy here to, to fill them back up if they're going to try to fill them back up. Uh, Goldman Sachs says, next U.S. president to have limited tools to significantly boost 2025 oil supply. Uh, and that deals with shale um, struggling to, to move on up. And I think uh, a lot of people talk about Trump getting into presidency and if it's good or bad for oil. Uh, what I would say there is... I don't think they really have a choice because the price of oil is too low for a lot of these 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 companies to bring back drilling significantly. The price of oil and natural gas, so they can't necessarily be like, "Oh, we'll we'll just drive oil prices lower than where they are today," because the rig count's already falling. Um, the companies don't want to produce at these prices already, so. I don't think it matters who's in presidency. Um, they may be able to impact if the price was too high and then they would open up drilling to try to lower it. But if it's at the price we're at today, uh, I don't think either president's going to really be too much of a big deal, in my opinion. Uh, the oil to gold price is roughly at 30 to 1. It's a little over 30. That has historically been incredibly cheap. So oil right now is at a cheap valuation and the rig count is a reflection of that cheap valuation. Uh, but if things were to reverse and move in the opposite direction, uh, we very well could um, struggle to have a lot more uh, production from the United States for a variety of reasons. If you want to get into those reasons, it's in the article uh, in there. Um, I'm going to skip over Kevin, and we'll we'll talk about that one at the end. It's a kind of a long thread, but I want to talk about uh, the AI bubble and his opinions on it. Uh, Brian Feroldi says, why fees matter visually? So this is talking about fees, and I, I don't hear a lot of people talk about fees. A lot of people say, well, you know, I'll just buy an ETF. Uh, well, the ETFs that I've seen have drastically underperformed a portfolio that is put together without fees. So I generally would like to pick my own companies uh, and then invest in individual companies and, and bypass all these fees. So what do the fees actually cost you? So starting, in, starting at uh, 2002 is the beginning point. We have a 0.3%, 1.3%, and 2.3% annual fee to show you the difference of the returns to you as an investor and what the difference of these difference in fees really is to the investor. So from 2002 to 2022, which is a 20 year time frame, a 2.3% fee leaves you at $180,000 ish. And this is starting at 10 grand. The 1.3% annual fee leaves you at 225 and the 0.3% annual fee leaves you at 275,000 bucks. So almost a $100,000 difference 
with a 2% annual fee difference. And if you have zero annual fee and you basically scrub all out the garbage out of the ETF, like the bigger companies, you could easily double this return here. So you could turn maybe, this is 100,000 uh, into uh, perhaps 300,000. Uh, but if you use smaller companies, I think you could easily outperform this. Um, I outperformed this in a few years in 2020 to where to 2022. Um, I actually turned less than 100,000 more and, and re returned it more than 300,000, um, way more. Uh, so, yeah, you can do it in a shorter period of time if you select the companies and you choose the good ones. Uh, and it's not necessarily good, I should say. I should say the ones that have more volatility and ones that are high cost producers, maybe they have a little bit of debt because they get sold down to pennies on the dollar at bottoms. Uh, here's Grady and commodities uh, TA cycle. So this chart, this ratio chart is building out the right shoulder in its 44 year inverse head and shoulders pattern. And now it has a pink double bottom. Revert, it's a reversal pattern breakout and back test, followed by higher high confirming the double bottom breakout. Gold is a proven safe haven and copper is a base metal that usually does well in good economic conditions. It equals Dr. Copper. Look at the huge move during the inflationary 70s for the ratio chart. It then consolidated the 70s move for 40 plus years. It now looks ready to go again. Said four years ago when posted this chart for the first time as the right shoulder was bottoming, that it was a time for another inflationary period like the 1970s. And since then, inflation has risen hugely. But it is only getting started, unfortunately. I also started the start, I also called the start of the commodity super cycle bull market at the same time back in early 2020. I've been in the game for 29 years and started the service because I want to help. As I see this is coming and the increasing need for proper guidance as the world becomes more and more unstable. So here's the big move of the 70s, the shoulder, the head, and then the shoulder that's driving out and we'll get a huge break. Uh, in his opinion, it's a 40 year, absolutely massive, great looking inverse head and shoulders. Uh, you could also call it other patterns too. It's just resistance and then it, yeah, head and shoulders double bottom breakout and back test reversal pattern followed by higher high. And that's, he's talking about this over here on the, on the shoulder there. Uh, so that looks like gold could drastically outperform copper. Um, I'm in the energy camp and I'm in the gold, the precious metals, I should say, camp. Um, I do think that those will outperform everything else in the inflationary period that's coming. Uh, oil is one of the most inflation sensitive assets. Same with precious metals. Kobayashi letter says, recession fears in the U.S. are growing. The SOM rule is an economic indicator suggesting a downturn once the, once the unemployment rate increases 0.5 percentage points above its previous 12-month low. In previous business cycles, every time this indicator crossed above the 0.5% threshold, a recession followed. Every time. It now stands at 0.4% just 0.1 percentage points away from signaling a recession in the United States. The unemployment rate would need to rise to 4.2% in this week's job report to break the threshold. Is the labor market signaling a recession? And this is the SON rule. It's a good predictor of recessions. The threshold for unemployment has correlated with recession eight times since 1965. So here's the SON rule. It's at 0.4% and the rule is triggered at 0.5 and we're just underneath it. So watch to see if the unemployment rate rises to 4.2% and it would trigger this 0.5%. Come on back. Justin, the US national debt surpasses 35 trillion for the first time in history. Uh, so there's some, some debt for you. Investment wisdom, Peter Lynch. There's a 100% correlation between what happens to the company and what happens to the stock. The trick is it doesn't happen over a week. 
or even over six to nine months. That's terrific. Sometimes fundamentals get better and the stock goes down. That's what we're looking for, says Peter Lynch. We're looking for that divergence between value and price, what he's talking about. Grady, a backtest for silver of that blue trend line at around $26 is still possible. But either way, this is a very good looking big picture chart. And I know some people get bearish, and their bearishness and bullishness is completely around the short term price movements. That's not what you want to do. You want to, to look for breakouts and stay bullish when you're broken out. We've broken the trend line here to the upside. Even if we go back to 26, we're still should be looking at this from a bullish mindset, not from a bearish mindset. The chart pattern looks fantastic. It's still good to go, guys. And even if we drop to 26, it's still good to go. Critical minerals cheat sheet from Sprott. So clean energy requires critical minerals. This is one thing I don't like. I don't like calling it clean energy. Renewables are not clean energy. Renewables, they, they, they use clean energy to persuade you into something, to make you think it's clean. What if clean energy, what if renewables are actually more environmentally damaging than fossil fuels? The only reason they try to brainwash everybody is because when you continue to call it clean energy, you actually start to believe it. It says critical minerals are essential for the global energy transition as we move to offset CO2 intensive energy sources with cleaner sources, including nuclear, electric vehicles, solar, wind, hydro, and geothermal energy. And the mess of minerals that it takes to do this is appalling. I'm all for, you know, uh, expanding population growth. I'm all for uh, increased energy and, and all that stuff. Uh, increased energy use is wealth. That's what it is. I just don't know how you get there using what they consider to be clean energy and things that don't emit CO2 by their definition. Although everything that is made in clean energy has CO2 wrapped all around it. Like it, you don't have renewable energy without CO2 from fossil fuels. If you were to take fossil fuels off the face of the planet, you would not have renewables because the energy return on energy invested is too low. And we're just digging holes everywhere in the ground, destroying the environment, and then putting these things and, and deforesting our, our, our forests to put in wind turbines and, and solar. I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. But it is incredibly mineral rich to do this. Brandon says, one of my favorite Stanley Druckenmiller quotes, people always forget that 50% of, of a stock's move is the overall market. 30% is the industry and maybe 20% from stock picking. So people forget that 50% of the move is overall market, 30% is the industry, 20% from stock picking. Uh, Eric Nuttall on global oil inventories just hit a record deficit relative to a normal baseline 2017-2019. Will and intent is working. And look at this thing dropping here. Uh, this, again, I want to go over, this is the sector. The sector is down in 2024 for oil inventories. And you can see the global oil inventory onshore, offshore, and the deficit. And we're hitting big deficits for oil here. But going back to Stanley, who is right here, they always forget that 50% of the stock move is the overall market, 30% is the industry. We're looking at the 30% of the industry, 50% is the overall market. And this is a part of the 30%. Grady says, the inverse correlation, gold versus the US dollar, can be strong in the shorter term. But longer term, it's not an issue for gold. Said recently, this chart is about to break out. It now has. So now also, this very important big picture chart shows that the next historical leg up for gold is here. And I think people stare at the short-term price movements and they miss the entire big picture view of this thing. We're in the third bull up leg of gold already. 
and silver is going to follow it. You think silver is going to go down with gold going up? Not a chance, in my opinion. I mean, maybe in the short, short term, but in the long term, these are going to be correlated and they're both going to go way, way up. It says, been consolidating for 12 years. Should be time for another big breakout looking at a similar red pattern inside the triangle, i.e. it's time for another long period when gold outperforms the USD and now got the big breakout. And this is HFI research. I think we went over this one last time with the uh, lower 48 natural gas production moving on up. I want, let's go back to this um, post by Kevin Bambro. I want to talk about this one. I want to read through a lot of it. They're, they're, it's a pretty long post, but um, I like talking about bubbles. Thread on AI bubble and my thoughts on how things will play out and the parallels to other bubbles like Y2K.com and the internet bubble. Back in the late 90s, I was working in tech with my main focus on upgrading firms to Microsoft desktops and servers, helping them go, helping them go fully digital. And for some time, it was, it was the first time they got email address and websites. It was the exciting dawn of the internet age. I learned a lot, and eventually what I learned caused me to flip careers and go into investing, trading, and never look back. From the very early onset, it was crystal clear that the internet was going to explode in popularity and everyone would be using it for business and personal needs. It was a massive wave to ride and leading up to Y2K, it was a crazy gravy train for anyone working in the field. All tech stocks at the time exploded higher and higher, creating the historic bubble we now look back on and everyone gets what happened in hindsight, but some actually saw it forming and correctly invested in it going up and shorted it going down. The question is, what did those people see that the others didn't at the time? Blow-off bubble came in part because of the rush to upgrade and replace computers and software to prepare for Y2K. For those of us focused on that work, we could see clearly that post Y2K, there's going to be a huge drop in new orders and slack would be coming in the tech labor market as well. But there's also a huge problem of overinvestment in general. Huge competition all over. Telecom capacity exploded while bandwidth compression tech grew creating overcapacity. The search engine space was being fought over. Even pure play browser focused companies were battling it out. Tech companies were the biggest investors in tech as well, building data centers, adding servers all over the world. But what started to become clear to some was that there was a lot of questions on who was going to actually who was going to make actually profits and win. What started to be clear was who was going to lose money, profits, and revenue. It quickly became apparent that the internet was a massive deflationary force. Consider sectors like the advertising space. Companies don't just all decide to increase ad spending and keep it higher. If they all did, they would have to pass on costs to the consumers in their products pricing. Instead, after some experimentation with internet advertising, what occurred was, a, was just a shift from traditional ad spending to internet ads. So for every winner, there was losers. I could go on and on through various sectors and businesses, but I think you get the idea. Today, we see the same characteristics of an unsuitable bubble forming in the AI space. Absolutely huge investments being made to battle for the best AI engines and tool offering for business and personal uses. It's a massive prize to be a winner or leader in this space. So this created a desperation that has been driving NVIDIA chip prices to insane levels, allowing them to make fat profit margins for the time being. But as much as there's an opportunity to win, there's a bigger fear of loss for many. I'd argue again that AI will prove to be massively deflationary for many sectors and some of the key companies investing in it might be just desperate trying to preserve business that is destined to be cut regardless. Consider AI search engines that are now being released. For some years now, I've been increasingly frustrated with the low quality of search engine results. So many paid advertising and sponsorship dominate the top results in major search engines. Google in the early days gave clean quality results, but its results as much more about who pays them than 
what is the best answer to search your questions. This results in being forced to often do multiple searches, refining search criteria keywords, and also looking pages deep in results. New AI search engines will surely deliver higher quality results, we all hope. But will this end up meaning less opportunity for advertising sales? Either way, total ad spending the world over won't be going up. AI-related ad spending will undoubtedly come at a cost to a company that is currently getting the ad revenue. So in my mind, all the big boys are currently in desperation battle to try to save their ad revenue versus grow it. Sure, there's new startups like OpenAI that may explode in value like Google did in the early days. But there's zero doubt in my mind that the winners will be stealing revenue and profits from existing businesses. The browser war of the late 90s, early 2000s was for a time won by Microsoft. They won it by giving away Internet Explorer for free with their operating systems. So basically no profit, all investment. Use it as a loss leader to keep dominance in their core business, operating systems, and the Microsoft software suite. There's always the law of unintended consequences. The AI ramp up will prove to have many of these. Google will invest billions upon billions trying to save their core search business, but only the naive will think this will be profitable for them. I think AI will cost Google prof profitability over time more than it will boost revenue and margins. What about Apple, Microsoft, Meta, Twitter, or other businesses investing heavily in the space? Who will be able to charge for AI services? How many subscriptions will business or individual need be willing to pay for? It is not more likely that all these businesses will invest in AI and then be forced to offer it for free or close to it. Will Apple feel pressured to give away AI chat search as part of Siri's offering just to keep market share of phones because perhaps Google's Android platform will be giving it away? Will all the search engines not have to adopt AI improved results and do so freely? Will the improved results not result in less clicks? Will the improved search results means less time on page app, less eyeball scrolling time to try to monetize? Will improved AI results mean less clicks through to inferior products or information sources? How many times do we find ourselves performing a search, clicking on a few different results, only to back up and click on another result trying to find what we are seeking? Each one of these clicks pays your search engine of choice. Getting us the results we want quickly is going to have ramifications. Meanwhile, every chip manufacturer is madly investing to compete with NVIDIA. The result of all that investment absolutely will result in lower margins for all, eventually excess capacity, possibly a collapse in margins altogether in a crash scenario where excess AI capacity is being offered for next to nothing. AI data center companies struggling to pay rent and electricity demands. The rally in tech stocks, when then spoke of investing in AI on conference calls or in the press releases will be drowned out by the results. Shrinking margins, negative ROI from the investment in the space. There's no doubt AI is going to be huge to revolutionize so many sectors and change our very habits and lifestyles dramatically. Just like the dawn of the internet did, but pile businesses with huge market caps disappeared or just got crushed. Most tech companies dropped at least 90% from their 2000 highs. Profit is king, and the AI space isn't going to magically make all tech companies more profitable. It will actually likely prove to be more deflationary in the early years, as winners and losers are sorted in excess capacity, inevitably will need to be dealt with in an energy-starved world. And that's what we've got there in his opinion about the AI bubble that is forming right now. And the way that I'm playing AI is through energy, an energy starved world. Uh, so that's where I'm going to end it, guys. I'm playing the commodity boom <laughs> and the energy starved world. Um, you know, another thing to think about if AI is successful, let's just say it is successful. Um, you know, what's going to need a lot more of it needs a lot more energy and it needs a lot more commodities. Uh, because the more efficient AI gets, it means that they are shrinking the lead times from building and converting commodities to usable products. Uh, and if that's the case, we are going to increase the input of commodities and energy dramatically. Uh, so I think that AI 
while it may be in a bubble for a lot of the companies here in the short term, I think in the long term, it's going to be a big driver of commodities. Uh, and what you're going to find out is that if if AI is successful, uh, the true wealth is all stored in commodities then, uh, commodities and energy. So that's what I've got for today, guys. Give me a thumb up for the content, subscribe to the channel, and we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.